Hello everyone, my name is Xue Luo, and on behalf of CGCC and CGCC Foundation, I welcome you to the fourth event of our Lunch and Learn ser series of this year. So please, it has been a while for me to host a seminar, so I write myself a note. Please bear with me for just one minute, and then I will give the stage back to the real star. So first, I would like to give you a brief review of CGCC Lunch and Learn series. As you know, we are a member-based organization and we care what our members care. So in the previous seminars, we've covered topics such as brand reputation management and crisis communication in the U.S. and or working with CVS on U.S. investment transactions and etc. So if you have any idea that you have a topic that you want to propose to us, so for a cooperation, you are definitely welcome. And today, we are honored to have Mr. Liu Jiang and Mr. Je Jeffrey Bell from Morrison and Forrester to give us a one-hour speech on the topic of China outbound mergers and acquisitions. Mr. Liu Jiang is a partner in Morphle's financial services practice. His practice spans a broad range of bank regulatory work and has he has significant experience representing foreign and U.S. financial institutions. Mr. Jeff Bell is also a partner in the firm's New York office, and he specializes in mergers and acquisitions, corporate finance, and security matters. Now, let's welcome Mr. Liu and Mr. Bell, and the Q&A section will follow after their presentation. Thank you. So it's great to be here again. I have known many friends and glad to meet new friends here at CGCC. I want to thank CGCC for the opportunity. I have been working with CCD Foundation for a couple of years now on a pro bono basis and also a, a proud member of CGCC. Um, so the very brief introduction of MoFo is just a typical U.S. big law firm. We have about a thousand lawyers, 17 offices. Uh, in China, we have Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong. In Europe, we have Brussels, London, and uh, uh, Berlin and U.S. And West Coast, we have San Francisco all the way down to uh, San Diego, Los Angeles, and Palo Alto. Here we have New York, D.C., and Northern Virginia, and, and Denver as well in the central. So that's a very brief introduction of the firm, and we're glad to talk about MA matters today. So Jeff will start on the, the, the transaction structure, etc. I'll talk about the regulatory uh, aspect. So thank you all for the opportunity um, to come speak to you today. I'm going to talk about three things in my portion of the presentation. I'm going to start out with a little information on the current state of the M&A markets. Then we'll talk about uh, common deal structures for M&A transactions in the U.S. And then we'll finish up um, again my portion by talking briefly about some of the um, common deal terms for uh, US m and transactions. So the first slide here shows recent trends in US uh, mergers and acquisitions over the years recently. <coughs> um, the bars represent aggregate deal value and the green dots represent number of deals. And so what we've seen recently is um, the 2015 was a very big year. There were a number of large deals in the market, um, and there was also a high volume by number of deals. 2016 uh, remained quite steady in terms of the number of deals, but there were obviously fewer large deals um, that year. What we've been seeing recently in 2017 um, is that the number of deals is down uh, significantly. The data for 2017 is only through August 10th of this year, uh, but you can still get a flavor of how um, 2017 is heading. I should mention this graph is um, all uh, M&A transactions, so both domestic and cross-border. We're going to have another slide coming up in a minute showing just um, China-U.S. cross-border deals. Th this map shows the um, most common uh, nations for inbound investments and M&A activity into the U.S. And it's no surprise um, the 
most active areas are, you know, Canada, Europe, um, Japan. What I would point out to this group is that China, the, the colors aren't showing up great here, but China is actually quite active and it would be on par with the level of activity that we're seeing from Mexico and Brazil. <coughs> Turning now to um, China-U.S. inbound M&A, um, what we've seen is the 2016 was actually a, a very big year for this segment of the deal activity. There were a number of um, deals, very large deals in the marketplace last year, and also the, the volume by number of deals um, was high. And what, what I find interesting from this is that Certainly by the number of deals, the inbound Chinese activity in 2017 is holding up relatively well compared to what we saw the overall um, deal volumes for 2017. So this um, is consistent with what we're seeing anecdotally in our practice is that um, there's, you know, concerns in the marketplace now, um, partly because of the new president. Um, people are very cautious, but the um, the deal activity is um, staying strong and even you know relatively strong uh, inbound from China. So the current uh, M and A uh, outlook, as I said, um, you know potentially a slower start to 2017, but the activity continues. We're seeing a lot of um, uh, middle market deals nowadays. The private equity um, has actually been relatively quiet. Most of the deals that we're seeing are um, strategic deals by operating companies. Uh, and there's, there is um, a lot of activity in the tech sector. There's increasing um, you know, questions about whether the tech sector is experiencing a bubble right now. So that's, that's basically the um, state of the market. What I want to do now is talk about some of the basic acquisition structures um, that companies use when they're doing M&A in the States. And typically, it falls into three categories. Um, you can have an asset purchase where the buyer purchases from the seller specifically identified assets. Or you can have a stock purchase where the buyer acquires the stock of the company that's the target and really takes the entire company uh, when it closes that deal. And then the third um, variation, it's got a couple variations, but it involves a, a merger. Uh, sometimes it's, we'll get to this later, it can be preceded by a tender offer. And these are the um, ways that um, in the US uh, buyers use to acquire control of publicly held corporations and to get 100% uh, ownership in those transactions by forcing the public stockholders to sell their shares. <coughs> So taking the first one first, um, an asset purchase um, involves the buyer picking uh, certain assets and certain liabilities that it wants to acquire from the target. And that gives the buyer the ability to you know, choose which liabilities that it wants to assume and which assets it wants to uh, take. That, Structure also allows it to get a step up in its tax basis, uh, but these structures uh, can frequently be a lot more complicated than a stock purchase because it requires so much care in identifying the assets and liabilities that are being acquired. And, and frequently, if it's a, a portion of the business that's being sold, there can be issues in separating that business out, if there's shared contracts or things like that, asset purchases tend to be um, a little more complicated than stock purchases. In a stock purchase, the, um, the buyer simply buys the equity of the, of the target company 
and it takes that target company subject to all of the assets and all of the liabilities that the company has. Um, it also involves fewer issues relating to the assignment of contracts. In an asset sale, one of the key assets that is um, will be assigned in those deals is the contracts that the target company is a party to which the buyer wants to take and an asset sale involves assigning those contracts to the buyer uh, but many contracts prohibit assignments like that without the consent of the counterparty in a stock purchase there is no assignment taking place because the contracts travel along with the target company. Um, so it makes the anti-assignment uh, analysis easier. However, there are some cases where contracts prohibit a change of control of the target company. And so stock purchase uh, transactions do constitute changes of control, which um, mm -hmm. people have to focus on. <coughs> One of the limitations of the stock purchase structure, though, is that each, if the buyer is going to acquire 100% in that transaction, then it requires all of the shareholders to agree to sell their shares. And when you have public targets with thousands of shareholders, this structure doesn't work. Um, and so what we come to is the third structure, which is a merger. Uh, which is used to um, acquire 100% of public targets. <clears throat> now, um, what happens in a merger is that the stockholders, if, if a stockholder vote is required, when the merger is approved, then upon the closing of the merger, all of the shares of the target company automatically get converted into the right to receive uh, the merger consideration and so even stockholders that do not vote in favor of the deal have their equity converted into the consideration and this is how the buyer is able to acquire 100% of the target. Frequently um, there are some other uh, additional bells and whistles on the structure that buyers can use they can often acquire the target through uh, the use of a separate uh, subsidiary, which then um, imposes a liability shield for the acquirer. Um, because when the target merges, then the combined entity succeeds to all of the liabilities of the target company. So if the target merges directly into the acquirer, then the acquirer would be effectively assuming um, potentially unknown liabilities of the target. So one of the common uh, structures that's used is to merge the target into a new subsidiary of the acquirer and um, in effect the target will become a new subsidiary of the acquirer going forward. The um, other thing worth noting on the merger is if there's a stockholder vote required um, the company will have to prepare and submit a proxy statement with the SEC. Uh, this takes time and expense, um, and it can usually take several months to go through that process and hold the stockholder vote uh, to approve the merger. So that is why there has actually been a further variation on the merger structure as people try to um, speed up the amount of time uh, between signing and closing, there's what is now called the two-step acquisition structure that people have developed that involves the buyer, um, usually again through a subsidiary, um, commencing a tender offer, offering to buy from the target stockholders the shares of the target that they own. And if the buyer is able um, in that tender offer to acquire a majority of the stock, then it can vote the shares that it purchases in the tender offer without having to convene a stockholder meeting and without having to clear a proxy statement with the SEC. So when this 
structure is available, it can um, substantially speed up the process. Um, and so what happens is if you get over 50% um, in the tender offer, the parent would control a majority of the target stock and be able to approve the second step merger that would then squeeze out um, the public stockholders who didn't sell their shares in the tender offer. In terms of the form of consideration, um, there's two choices. You know, cash, everybody knows the value of cash. Cash is uh, still the most common form of consideration in the marketplace, but it is possible to use stock of the acquirer as consideration um, in certain cases that can um, that can be done on a tax-free basis where the stockholders of the target um, don't recognize a taxable gain on that sale but it involves uh, a number of issues there's a number of securities law issues when you use uh, stock as a consideration because the stock has to be registered with the SEC and there's a number of potential risks of the that stock fluctuating in value uh, between signing and closing. So that can produce a number of other issues for uh, the negotiation. <clears throat> I'll talk next about a couple of distinctions between deals for private targets uh, versus public targets. In um, the public target context, the board, there's a lot of emphasis put on the fiduciary duties of the board. Um, I will talk about that in a minute. Um, but the, the main um, issue is that the board, when it's approving a sale of the company, it needs to um, try to get the, the best price for the stockholders that it is reasonably attainable. This is, some of you may have heard of the Revlon uh, case in Delaware, and that's the, the Revlon test. So boards um, are very focused in the public context of maximizing the price and the certainty uh, for the target stockholders. Um, public companies, because they're subject to SEC reporting requirements, have to disclose a lot of um, material information to the public that's that's already out there. When a uh, public company is potentially negotiating with a, a buyer, they will, however, require a non-disclosure agreement uh, and usually a standstill before engaging in negotiations with the buyer. What a standstill what a, what a non-disclosure agreement says is that the buyer will keep confidential any non-public information that the target shares with the buyer. And the standstill is um, a promise by the buyer not to commence a hostile offer for the company. So one of the big concerns of a board of directors of a public company when it's undertaking a process like this is that it wants to maintain control over the process. Uh, it will frequently be conducting an auction, speaking with multiple bidders, trying to find the best price that it can. And the target wants to make sure that none of those bidders falls out of the process and does something disruptive like commencing an unsolicited offer for the company. Um, what what typically will happen, again, this is because of the fiduciary duties um, that the board has, is the board will either need to conduct a pre-signing auction or market check where they speak with the likely acquirers of the company to see if they can get the best price. Or if the board doesn't do that, then in order to satisfy their fiduciary duties, um, what sometimes uh, deals will allow is that after the target company signs the agreement to be acquired, 
it can then go out for a period of 30 days or 45 days and have a go shop period where it goes and tests the market after it's already signed an agreement to be acquired. But if, if that go shop results in a better offer, the board would have the ability to terminate the first deal and accept the better offer. <coughs> um, typically, there's a, a well-developed um, set of terms around this uh, issue. And so most merger agreements will allow uh, the board to change its recommendation and terminate a deal in order to accept a superior proposal. Uh, what the courts have said in Delaware is that it's um, permissible to uh, give the buyer, the original buyer, a matching right. So that yes, the board can accept a superior proposal, but it can only do that if the buyer refuses to match the new bidder's price. Um, and so there's a lot of technology around these provisions and the mechanics there. Um, typically, if the company terminates the deal with the first buyer to accept a superior proposal, then it will have to pay a termination fee to compensate the first buyer for that. Um, this is where there's some um, other case law around what are the permissible terms of those termination fees uh, because the board, the, the fees can't be so high as to preclude the ability of the board to accept a superior proposal. This um, set of issues, I will just quickly say, also frequently involves a lot of discussion around a reverse termination fee. And a reverse termination fee is a fee paid by the buyer to the target if the buyer fails uh, to close when it's required to or if the buyer breaches its ob obligations under the agreement. And the, um, what we're seeing, um, and, and this has come up, you know, uh, particularly with some of the recent Chinese deals in the marketplace, is when target companies are really concerned uh, about the buyer that they're dealing with, they will ask for a higher reverse termination fee than the company's termination fee if it breaches the obligation. Because there's no um, judicial concerns that limit the size of the reverse termination fee. The courts are um, solely focused on not making the company's termination fee too large. Um, just briefly on friendly versus unsolicited or hostile transactions. Hostile transactions are still relatively rare in the marketplace. Um, what happens in a friendly deal is the board and the buyer talk and they reach an agreement. In an unsolicited transaction, the board doesn't want to talk to the buyer, and so in various ways, the buyer has to attempt to communicate directly with the target's public stockholders. This can involve letters in the press, it can involve an unsolicited tender offer, but usually, hostile situations are resolved at the ballot box through a proxy contest to replace the target's board of directors. And the only thing I'll add to this slide is they can, hostile campaigns can often take years, certainly months, to play out. And what's interesting is that when the hostile offeror is successful, there is no conclusion to a hostile transaction because when the bidder is successful, then the board flips and it becomes a friendly deal at the end. So usually all hostile deals that are successful become friendly at the end and when they sign the agreement, it looks like a regular agreement. <clears throat> um, touching on the fiduciary duties of boards of directors in the US. Um, there's two basic fiduciary duties that boards have to follow. One is the duty of care and one is the duty of loyalty. And basically, 
the duty of care says that in making um, decisions on behalf of the stockholders, the board of directors needs to try. They need to look at all the available information. They need to consider it all in good faith um, and use reasonable care I involving experts if they need to. Uh, but they need to put in a good faith effort to reach the right conclusion. The duty of loyalty really just says you cannot be conflicted if a director um, has a conflict, if there's a controlling stockholder that has um, appointed the board. These are all factors that would limit the board's ability to put the interests of the stockholders first. And that's what is required by the duty of loyalty. Um, what these mean in practice is um, whenever a company agrees to sell itself, it will hire an investment banker to advise it to, so that the board can be sure that it's getting a fair price and that the process has been run fairly um, and that the board is satisfying their fiduciary duties when they're doing a transaction like that. It's also this set of issues that um, requires the board to have the ability to terminate the first agreement and accept a superior proposal uh, later on if there is one. That's something the Delaware courts um, have been clear on. What I would also say on this slide is we often get questions from companies a lot who say we're thinking of acquiring this target but we're not sure we want to yet so we have this idea we're going to buy 15% of the equity now. Uh, you know, we'll get in the door, see if we like the target company, and then if, if it works out, we can then acquire the remaining 85% later. This is usually a very bad idea. Um, if you want to buy the company, buy the company. What, what happens when you do a minority interest is that um, from a legal analysis, you effectively become a significant or a controlling stockholder and you then owe fiduciary duties to the minority and it means you have to deal at arm's length with the company, you have to set up procedures that can substantially complicate uh, that second step later on when you have to um, acquire the remaining uh, stock. It can become a, a lot more difficult because at that point the company will be negotiating with what the courts view effectively as a controlling stockholder. <clears throat> so the punchline there is think very carefully before you pursue any minority investments if there's a chance that you'd want to um, acquire the whole company. The final um, thing I just want to talk about is a few recent developments. In the public company context, um, stockholders who do not like the transaction and who vote against the transaction have the ability to pursue a judicial appraisal proceeding. This is a court case that gets filed in Delaware. It usually takes years to play out. So it's, it's kind of a rare proceeding. But the stockholders who jump through all these hoops are entitled to have um, the court determine the fair value of their shares if they think that that fair value is higher than the price being paid in the merger. And what happened over the last, you know, 10 years or so is that this became a little bit of a, an arbitrage for some of the hedge funds um, and sophisticated players out there because the statute for appraisal proceedings says that if, if there's money that's owed to the, uh, the stockholder, then the, the company has to pay that money to the stockholder with interest at a 5% interest rate from the date of the merger. So 5% interest rates are, has been a really good return in the market recently. And a lot of hedge funds have said, you know, to earn that kind of a return over a proceeding that takes a couple years to play out and we are confident that we're going to get a recovery, a lot of people have 
been uh, pursuing appraisals recently. And so what happened was the um, legislature of Delaware last year passed some technical amendments um, intended to allow companies to cut down on the, uh, the number of appraisal proceedings. There has also been over the last decade an explosion of stockholder litigation. Um, in, in fact, there was a study done where 98% of deals involving a company uh, with a value of greater than $100 million attracted a lawsuit. And these lawsuits are primarily designed to generate fees for the lawyers, and that's it. They, they rarely result in meaningful recoveries for the stockholders. Um, the vast majority of the time, what happens is the company agrees to um, make additional disclosures about the deal um, in order for the plaintiff's lawyers to act like they, they created something of value and they can get paid and then the whole thing goes away. And this has been, like I said, 98% of deals are, have been attracting litigation. The courts have recently really started pushing back. They've indicated over the last year they're not going to approve disclosure-only settlements anymore. And so the mix of stockholder litigation for M&A transactions has started to, um, to shift recently because the courts are pushing back. And then the final thing, um, this actually just went into effect a couple weeks ago. We don't know what it means yet in practice, but the, um, we, we think it, it could involve some interesting developments. Delaware, which is the leader in U.S. corporate law, um, amended its statute to permit corporations to um, use blockchain technology uh, to keep records of their corporate stock ledger. Um, and so that's, we, we've, even outside of the M&A context, we've started seeing a lot of um, blockchain questions and activity from our clients, which we think um, that's a technology that may um, become more commonplace going forward. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Zhang, and then we can do questions at the end. Or I guess let's do that. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Jeff. So I'll just spend the next 10 minutes or so to talk about regulatory issues um, as they relate to uh, investments and acquisitions in the U.S. Some are probably more interesting than others. Um, the first is um, Section 13 of the uh, Security Exchange Act uh, mandates filing requirements by acquirers acquiring more than 5% uh, of a U.S. public company. So th this is on the uh, acquirer itself. Uh, you'll be required to file Section uh, Schedule 13D or Schedule 13G, depending on the facts and circumstances. A 13D must be filed within 10 days of uh, acquiring, uh, breaching the 5% threshold. And then once a company becomes a 13D filer, you have the obligation to file amendments whenever there's an increase or decrease in your beneficial ownership of 1% or more. So a slight change won't matter, but 1%, you need to file an amendment. And that obligation continues until you get below 5%. Uh, it's not on the slide, but when you get to below 5%, you file a so-called exit filing, checking the box saying, this is my last filing. I don't own more than 5% uh, of the company anymore. So that's Schedule 13D filing. Now, Schedule 13G is a shorter form. Um, it's generally available to so-called passive investors. That is, you acquire shares of a company without the intent without the effect of influencing the control of the company. So you would file a Schedule 13G. Now, who are the passive investors? The passive investor is the one, as I described, acquiring shares without the intent, without the effect of having the control or influence on the control of the company. And it may not have more than 20% of the target. So anytime uh, acquire acquires more than 20% of a, a target, then you will be deemed not, not be able to file 13G, you're not a passive investor, so you have to file a section uh, Schedule 13D under uh, 13D. 
So now section 16 of the exchange act has requirements on the so-called insiders. So these are not requirements on the acquiring company itself. These are on the officers, directors, and beneficial owners of the public company here. So they are the so-called insiders. And section 16B, uh, we, you know, according to 16B, the company, the issuer, can um, ask you, if you are the insider, to disgorge short swing profits. That is, if you are, if you are an insider, you trade within six months of each other, buy and sell. Uh, this, there's a strict liability. The company doesn't have to prove uh, you use inside information. As long as you are an insider, you trade within six months, you have to disgorge the profit to the issuer. Uh, Section 16A has requirements, um, uh, filing requirements on the insiders, so-called forms three, four, and five. Basically, form three is the so-called initial statement of beneficial ownership. If you become an insider, if you become a director, you, you file form three, you say, I, don't, I own nothing, or I own 10 shares. Uh, form four is for uh, any changes in your beneficial ownership. You need to file within two days of your transaction. And form five is an annual statement of beneficial ownership, filed within 45 days of the end of the year. Now, for any m and transaction, there's always an anti-trust uh, concern. There are many uh, numbers by which you hit the threshold, you need to uh, do an HSR notification. But probably the most important number is the for this year is roughly $81 million. That is, if you acquire $81 million of assets or securities, then you have an HSR notification obligation. There's a mandatory 30-day waiting period. You, know, you file with the antitrust division of the DOJ. They may look at the transaction. They, they may tell you you need to divest certain assets, or they may just stay silent, just sign off on the transaction. And most typically, every law firm will have like special specialists handling uh, HSR filings. Uh, now, Cepheus, you're probably more interested in uh, Cepheus. It's created uh, under the uh, Defense Production of 1950, amended in 2007 again. So it's an inter-agency uh, committee of the U.S. government. It may review any type of merger, takeover, uh, that could result in foreign control of U.S. business that implicates national security. So the first thing is CFIUS filings are confidential and voluntary. You don't have to file. There have been plenty of transactions gone through without a CFIUS filing. But CFIUS has the authority to initiate its own investigation after the fact if you don't file. And if they don't like it, they can actually tell you to unwind the transaction, which can turn an uh, ugly. Um, in 2012, Rouse Corporation is a, is, a, is a corporation owned by um, senior executive of Sun Yi Group. Uh, it acquired a wind farm in the state of Oregon. It didn't bother to file a uh, Cepheus application. But when Cepheus found out, uh, the location of the wind farm is very close to a naval weapon testing center. So on that basis, Cepheus said, sorry, you just have to divest. So Rouse uh, had to divest. They actually sued. Uh, President Obama and US government, the lawsuit was settled on undisclosed terms, but that deal was there. And another uh, example was actually Huawei. In 2011, they spent a small amount of money, $3 million. They bought some assets from a US technology company called Three Leaf. Uh, CFIUS found out they didn't like it. They suggested to Huawei, you, you may want to sell these assets. So it's not an official order, but the suggestion from CFIUS <laughs> since is, means you should do it, so Huawei gladly complied. So. Um, more recently, you may have heard in the market, uh, there's a lot of so-called refiles. So what happens is when you file uh, a, a notification, they have 30 days you know, to sign up. If they need more time, they tell you we need another 45 days to investigate. And then they can either send the matter to the president and say, we can't decide, but that generally means the president will block it. Or if they don't want to do that, they'll tell you, say, why don't you voluntarily just withdraw your application? Because if you don't, I have to tell the president to block it. So you withdraw and you refile, then we get another 75 days. So for example, recent high profile transactions, uh, China Ocean Wide's 2.7 billion proposed acquisition of Genworth Financial, Canyon Bridge's 1.3 billion acquisition of Lattice Semiconductor, and more famous, I guess, and financials $1.2 billion acquisition of MoneyGram. 
they have all been asked to refile some three times already. So you may want to know why the delay, why all the refiles, you know, now is under the new administration. It has, I think, primarily uh, uh, three reasons. One is this year alone, we expect to have close to 300 CFIUS filings compared to about 200 of last year. So it's simply a much larger number of cases filed with the CFIUS. And secondly, um, there's a lack of senior leadership at CFIUS. Uh, a lot of government uh, appointments have not been made or confirmed. Uh, one example is a, uh, Alan Overy partner, he's Tarbert. Uh, he has been nominated to be the assistant secretary in charge of international financial markets and had the CFIUS operation. He's actually my uh, law school classmate. But he has not been confirmed yet. So what's happening now is CFIUS staff members, they're reviewing the applications. They don't want to be in a position to be looked back upon later. So they're very cautious. So that, that's, you know, the, the, the reason of number of cases and the lack of leadership right now is causing the delay. The third reason probably everybody's talking about is the new administration. Uh, the, the, the growing trend is that the CFIUS review has been getting more difficult. Well, this actually started even before the new administration. So I just want to give you some quotes. Uh, in November of 2016, a congressionally established so-called U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission issued a 500-page plus CFIUS report. And in the report, I'm quoting one of their recommendation is Congress amend the statute authorizing CFIUS to bar Chinese state-owned enterprises from acquiring or otherwise gaining effective control of U.S. companies, unquote, end quote. So that's a flat out, you know, recommendation to say SOEs from China cannot buy U.S. companies no matter what. I mean, obviously, it's not in the legislation, but that's, you know, the recommendation by the uh, Economic and Security Review Commission. And then in January 2017, still under Obama administration, the Council of Advisors on Science and Technology issued a report regarding you know, the, the status of semiconductor industry. And it, it, it highlighted that China's efforts to, quoting again, reshape the market in its favor uh, by investing billions of government uh, money in U.S. semiconductor industry. So you, you can tell it's already growing, going to be more, uh, 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 you know, uh, a stringent CFIUS review. Then Treasury uh, Secretary Steve Muchin said in his confirmation hearing, he said, he would work with Congress to review, modernize, and potentially expand CFIUS powers as needed uh, in respect to you know, the review of investment by state-owned enterprises. So you know, the, the CFIUS review is going to get tougher, unfortunately. And even without amending the legislation to make it even tougher, the administration has lots of discretion under the current laws to restrict transactions involving uh, foreign entities. A few years ago, if you ask people, you know, what would CFIUS be mostly concerned about, you would say, well, critical infrastructure, anything related to weapon, airplane, all that. But these days, it, it's much more broader than that. Uh, it, it can be personal information. Now, that's national security. Uh, it can be soft power, media um, uh, companies. Uh, it can be artificial intelligence, drone technology, all that. So before you embark on acquisition, those issues should be uh, uh, think about. One of the things Jeff mentioned earlier uh, was the reverse breakup fee. Uh, these days it has uh, come up to almost 10% for some transactions. So that's not an insignificant amount, the 10% reverse breakup fee. Again, it's not protected by, by any uh, data well because it, it's on the, uh, on the query itself. Now there's industry regulation. I, I'd like to talk a few minutes, probably focusing a little more on banking and insurance because that, that, that's what I uh, practice primarily in. Uh, insurance, it's state regulation, different states, different regulations. Generally speaking, 10%, that's a threshold of control, so you need approval. Uh, for banking, it's a little more complicated. Uh, the threshold could be 5%, it could be 10%, depending on uh, who is the acquirer. For example, years ago, Minsheng Bank acquired 9.9% .9 of United Commercial Bank in uh, California. 9.9, no approval required. But obviously that bank failed, that means it was not able to uh, make more investment due to uh, regulatory restrictions. 
of other Chinese banks, um, a lot of them here were in Bank of China, uh, the, the threshold is 5%. So for any Chinese bank to buy more than 5% of a U.S. bank or non-bank, Federal Reserve approval uh, would be uh, required. In 2000, well, this is a, a real case, so and it's not confidential. It's my client, so I can talk about it. In 2013, uh, I represented Citic Securities in the acquisition of CLSA. You know, CLSA is a global brokerage firm. It has a U.S. subsidiary, CLSA Americas, um, and we needed to get Federal Reserve approval. It, it, the, 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 this case shows how important it is of regulatory approvals. Um, uh, acquirer must consider because it tends to be the strategic department thinking about what I want to buy, but they may or may not know the company's global operations, right? So they just say, okay, I want to buy this company. So in this case, um, we filed the application to acquire CLS Americas. Then almost at the same time, um, this is public information, one of city securities uh, affiliates in Hong Kong uh, was you know, allegedly by the SEC bought securities of a Canadian company by the name of Nexon. Uh, CNUC was going to buy Nexon and reported that affiliate bought Nexon the, you know, a day before the announcement and sold it the day of the announcement, made, made a handsome profit. So SEC initial investigation against that affiliate is ultimately settled. There's no admission of guilt or anything, uh, disgorged profit. Uh, but the Federal Reserve said, well, if there's an investigation on an affiliate which has nothing to do with this acquisition, we're not going to consider this acquisition. So that put us on ice for uh, almost two years. But fortunately, we were able to get a temporary approval saying, you know, you are approved, but on a temporary basis, depending on the outcome of that investigation, meaning we have the right to, you know, reject your transaction at the end. So the process started really in 2012 because you don't just file an application when you buy, you, you engage in prior discussions. The process started in 2012, really ended uh, just last year, in July of 2016. We got the final, final approval uh, for the city securities to own uh, CLSA. So that's just how important regulatory approvals are. And then there are other, obviously, different industry-related approvals, public utilities. This is something most people don't think about, but it actually may come up. Uh, near the end of a transaction, people realize, oops, we should have done the FERC filing. Uh, for example, uh, years ago, we represented uh, another large Chinese investment fund by 9.9% .9 of Morgan Stanley. I mean, that we didn't miss it, we just knew it. We had to do a FERC filing. Nobody would think it's Morgan Stanley. Why would you need to do a FERC filing? But yeah. Um, then telecommunications, FCC approval for you know, controlling transactions. In the gaming industry, there's always a, a suitability requirement. Uh, under Nevada law. So I'm just going to wrap up by uh, <coughs> saying regulatory consideration is very important before um, you initiate a discussion uh, of a cross-border uh, transaction. We're happy to take any questions you may have.